thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we, we had a tremendous turnout. We're really uh, very uh, pleased with the turnout, and it's nice to see uh, many of our customers as well as our partners who are on the line. And hopefully, we'll you know we'll have a productive uh, session, and you guys will come back with some uh, some meaningful data. Um, Mike Shabet and I have what we call a lot of scar tissue, and uh, those of you in the industry know what what that means. I've seen Michael go for a ride on a conveyor and other material handling equipment, and um, I'm sure he's got some good war stories to 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 share with us as we as we go on. So I'm going to uh, move on to the next screen, and uh, you recognize his good friend, the Terminator. Uh, that's a, perhaps what uh, what we think about when we think of artificial intelligence, but actually I think it could be a force for good. Um, we have a, a, a range of both technical and non-technical people on the uh, in the audience, so the, the the this presentation won't be too technical. So I have to give a little bit some introductory concepts, so that to, to just to help uh, bring the business people along, and uh, then we will get into some technical things. Uh, we talk about how how machines learn, what the differences between artificial intelligence and machine learning, where does RFID fit in this discussion? And that's obviously why everybody's on the line, but we'll get into that. We've got some retail use cases about how this approach can help you solve some really vexing problems in the retail uh, supply chain, as well as an industrial uh, use case or two that this, that, uh, for uh, the products that don't fall into the traditional a retail paradigm. And of course, we'll be open for some questions. So let's get started. Um, we'll make the Terminator uh, terminate him. This is a great example of artificial intelligence. You gotta admit, it's very cool. It's the Google Translate app. And basically, you point your phone at a sign, or in this case, at a menu, and it translates it on the fly, just like a human being would, just like you know, actual intelligence. A person who can speak a second language is able to look at a menu or a sign, and he translates it in his, in his head. The, uh, those of us that don't speak foreign languages, uh, it's this way you use the app, you select which uh, language it's going to translate to, and it uh, does that pattern recognition and really, uh, you know, converts on the fly. It's super powerful. So, on a broad sense, artificial intelligence is machines carrying out tasks in a way that we consider smart. It's an oddball way of looking at it, but it's true. This is a smart thing to do, to, to um, take a picture of a sign or a menu and translate it on the fly. It's literally a, something that we take for granted with our brains, but it's very similar to natural intelligence as artificial intelligence. The key is that machine learning is narrower. It basically this concept that we should be able to hand to the to a, to the computer, to the system of computers, to a network of computers, a batch of data, and the machines will learn by themselves to help us solve a problem. So you've got something that's um, a broad concept would be. The artificial intelligence where it's almost wired like our brain and uh, in the machine learning sense which is a narrow uh, uh, a narrower sense where we're taking a bucket of data we ask the machine to look at it make something meaningful out of it and give us some insight so in a sense machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence it's a small Here's a, uh, another way, which is, you're familiar with our friend Alexa. Alexa has something called NLP, Nat Natural Language Processing. It's the user interface for Alexa and Siri and Cortana. And why? In, in that it, it, it communicates, you know, with the English or, language or Chinese or Greek, whatever language you're talking to it, and um, it ha 
has this concept of of sentences, literally, and commands, and and this whole you can converse with it with, it, with to a degree, and that is your user interface for dealing with it. Now, in our case, you don't necessarily need to have natural language processing to be able to communicate with your RFID data. Although, in theory, you certainly could by building a an Alexa uh, skill set or et cetera, and you have uh, particular queries that you could ask Siri or Alexa to run, but it's not the same. The actual foundation under which Alexa, Siri, and company operate is um, is a natural language processing, and that is built into their uh, d design, which is how to, um, it's almost like you know, the branching logic, and 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 the, the, they try to mimic the way a human would understand language. But it's not such a case. But one of the things that's really important is that Alexa and her friends and machine learning in general, it needs big data. Uh, and, you know, in other words, the cloud, you, you, we didn't have Alexa until you had the cloud. And meaning that it, it's really an astonishing amount of data. The larger the sample sets, the better the stuff gets. And that's a very important uh, point about machine learning, and that if you give it one or two examples, it can't make any, can't learn anything, and it learns the more you feed it um, uh, uh, data, and that's why the cloud is so critical in a, um, in, a in machine learning, and while plenty of the tools that are for machine learning, you can find them in the cloud. Okay, so how do machines learn? This is a big question, and it starts off. Basically, recognizing patterns. Now, there's many other uh, types of processing that's going on, but in its most simple sense, mach machines learn by recognizing patterns. For example, objects in real scenes. And in our case, that's very close to what we're trying to, to determine is an, you know, a, a product in a supply chain or, or, or we're trying to identify patterns. You know, facial identity, of course, which is, you know, think about how challenging that is, uh, doing that out of a moving video. That's a tremendous pattern recognition, pattern matching at very high speed. And of course, with Alexa and Siri and company, uh, the able to uh, recognize a pattern of spoken word. So here's a simple pattern. On the one on the left, find the O in a sea of Qs. And on the right, find the Q in a sea of Os. You can ask this of a blob of data. You feed this blob of data, and you tell the um, the uh, they ask the system to, to 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 study this to determine what 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 the pattern is. And here's a joke, a cartoon where sweetheart, I fear something did not work right with how we applied the law of attraction, or he has a problem with pattern recognition. As the, the stripes obviously interfere with the pattern that's in the room. So, Google fed thousands of pictures tagged cat into the Google Photos app machine learning initial data set to teach the software how to identify a cat by, by, by pattern matching. So they, they fed the um, you know you know x number very large number of pictures of cats, so that when you take a picture of a cat with your phone, and that goes up into the Google's Photos app, they automatically can characterize the picture of of this kid, and that's a cat, as a baby cat or whatever, and. This is in a, in, a, in a basic nutshell. So they train the software, they set it a very large uh, data set, and then they pattern match to see, okay, these are cats. That must be a cat. Another way machines learn is by discovering anomalies. So that's like there's pattern matching and anomaly. So the uh, an unusual pattern is then, okay, what doesn't meet the, the pattern um, is an anomaly. So, for example, an unusual pattern of a sensor reading. 
So everything's going along fine, and then boom, you get spikes at a certain time. Something's different. The machines learn by n noticing that there's a difference in the sensor reading. And this is a really key point. So it's either I see a lot of the things that, uh, uh, you know, recognizing the pattern and then recognizing the anomalies and being to identify them. So to review here, to solve a problem with machine learning, the machine learning algorithm must have a pattern. So something's got to be, you know, predictable and there's that pat must have a pattern to, to, to glean, to infer from. And then you've got to give it enough of sample examples to apply machine learning to a problem. I apologize here for this that's going on. Um, so there was, we're in the third stage of computing. The first stage of computing was called tabulation. Uh, punch cards, uh, the Hollerith tabulating machine, if you recall, the beginning uh, for IBM's first machine, which was just um, uh, like punch cards, but literally it could count and it would summarize. Then we went into the, the era that we're in now, which is the transactional era of processing. And that is, is that you can break problems down into their um, individual program steps, such as divide, uh, um, average, uh, sum, yeah, all the functions that we do, let's say, in Excel. But obviously, for programmers who are working on application systems or even in a, a program like PageMaker or, um, or a GIS system, do, you can break that down into the smaller, to these very small chunks and be able to apply a uh, series of instructions to, to achieve the, the result. The third step, which is where what we're talking about here is called cognitive uh, computing. And that is, is that if you can't formulate a mathematical expression to describe the behavior of the problem, you want the computer to look at the pattern to examine the data and come out and infer the and learn and figure out the uh, insight all by itself. That's uh, that because it's it's it, it, yes you could do it, but it would take you so many 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 man hours that it would be very uh, impractical. So machine learning is derives meaning from the data. This it finds patterns, finds an am uh, anomalies, and then it performs structured learning. Structured learning meaning that it, it does go through loops and it tests and it did a, you know, we're looking at those pictures, for example, in the Google app, it goes, is it a bridge? Is it a dog? Is it a cat? Oh, it's a cat. You know, and turn around again. It looks like the cat example that we have. Uh, and that, you could do this with, with anything. Again, too big of a job for uh, a human programmer to break it out and try to do a one instruction at a time, but these systems using the cloud, using the processing of the cloud, uh, are able to um, to infer this uh, uh, meaning um, from this data and these patterns, and it goes through the structured learning process. The continuing how they learn, it's an iterative process, and that's a key point, is that if you, uh, you, know, you want to get into this and you want to, to use this, it's iterative. And that means you first you add the data. So that means you're going to feed these tremendous data sets to the machine learning system. You, it's not a human hands off at all. You know, not, not, I don't want you to, to anybody to think that. It does require um, the cleaning and and prepping of the data, and specifically, you know, for example, with those photos of cats. If there was a cat and a dog in the picture, you probably want to snip away the dog so that the uh, it's a very clean pattern for the um, you know a clean picture of a cat for the 
for that test, for that sample to be able to process. But it, remember, it doesn't have to be cats. It could be bolt, you know, a, a, a bolt, a hex, a hex bolt, uh, whatever, a, 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 an eight millimeter bolt is a certain kind of bolt. And then you could be able to, to, to um, create a sample of perfect pictures of eight millimeter bolts. And then the anomaly would be one that's chipped. So if you were doing a machine vision inspection, it would catch the bad one um, because it's pattern matching against the samples of what good ones are. Or, go another way, you could take a picture of all your bolts that you cut out of your toolbox spread out on the floor, and it could total them up. And just by pattern matching all the way around, it would be able to give you an inventory of the bolts that are, that are in your box. But the idea being that you, the humans are required to clean and prepare the, the, this data and to train the model, to, to, to train it for the pattern that we're looking to identify, okay? And to give a, a good example of this is if you, if, uh, if you recall, um, IBM Watson won Jeopardy, the TV show, and think about how they had to train Watson for Jeopardy. So there was two parts of it. There was training it how to you know, with the, all the material that could possibly be an answer, and then the harder part, actually, was training it with natural language processing to understand how um, Jeopardy asks questions or gives answers, and, you have, and then the machine would have to pose the questions that gave the, you know, with that answer. So that was, that was actually very difficult for Watson to do. But in terms of training, it, training the model uh, to begin with, they had to load the entire encyclopedia. They had to unload, uh, let's say, you know, billboards of um, song titles for the past 50 years or the uh, Academy Award uh, winning film, films for every category, et cetera. So because as if you think of the breadth of the categories that Jeopardy asked questions about, all of that data had to be fed into the system so that it would be able to uh, you know, have the answer at hand as well as understand the clue and then make the question. And then you test it. Uh, so just like I explained with the cats, uh, you, you uh, present with a, something that is you know, unknown even and ask the system, well, well, well what is this? And if it comes back and, and gives you a crazy you know, result, then you've got to train the model a little better. Um, and if it's close, then you can find, then it's fine tune, or you continue and let it process further and improve it. So the idea is this iterative process, and it's rinse and repeat. We'll rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And, and after the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or iterations, whatever it takes, then the system starts to learn by itself because it's got so much test data in there, it's got refined models, and um, it can make decisions based on the patterns and the anomalies, the anomalies that it sees. If you have any questions, please pass them along. Uh, we will have time for, for some more. So that's the basic overview of machine learning and the subset of artificial intelligence. So let's talk about Next, where does RFID fit in? Well, let's think about you know, the miracle of our brains. My God, we instantly process sight, which includes color, light, we, uh, we can, and reading, and all the other things that we do with our sight. Uh, we instantly process sound, uh, touch, taste, smell. Pretty incredible, right? So how does this apply in your world? Well, the the human brain takes all that data and makes sense of it. We somehow process it. There's the, the neurons and the synapses and the loops in the brain, etc. There we go. Okay. So, with in your business, you've got video, you've got loss prevention video, you have the weather, humidity, temperature. You're you're responsible for it, right? You may not. Think about it all the time, but you certainly do if you've got a thermostat in your factory, store, 